Hello, everybody. I'm Helen Cross. I'm the current president of the International League Against Epilepsy, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here to this e forum emergency seizure plans across the ages. We have a great selection of speakers, Lieben Lage, Lisa Kalgan, and Adam Stachek, who are going to talk about various aspects of use of emergency seizure rescue medication across the ages. At this point, I'd like to thank our sponsors of RE4 this year, the Silver Supporters, Jav Pharmaceuticals and UCB, and the supporter Neuralis. We're really grateful for their support. Next slide. We have an hour of talks with some degree of interaction, but then on the hour, we will have a further 30 minutes for um, discussion amongst the panel with question and answer. So if you have questions, please feel free to type them into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen so that we can address those in those 30 minutes. At the end of the e-forum, we will also ask you to complete a short survey. There'll be a QR code for you to um, uh, be able to access that, access that. And we would be really grateful if you feed back so that we're able um, to work on uh, e for in the future. You will have received um, the access to some pre-reading materials, papers. We have the forum today with discussion, and then tomorrow you will receive a link to a case to further um, consolidate your learning from the webinar. So with no further ado, um, first of all, I'd like to just um, highlight the conflicts of interest of our three speakers. And then introduce our first speaker, Professor Lieben Lager from University Hospitals in Leuven in Belgium, who's going to talk about emergency seizure plans in childhood. Thank you, Lieben. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, happy to be here and to uh, talk about this, I think, quite important topic, uh, managing uh, prolonged seizures and uh, status epilepticus in childhood. Uh, really is important and really made already a difference. Uh, if I see in the current practice, we see less severe cases because we are able to treat children earlier on than uh, waiting for like half an hour before we would go to the first treatment. So can I have the next slide, please? Um, these are the topics I would like to cover, uh, touch upon. I, I would like to say something about uh, what happens during uh, a seizure and especially during a prolonged seizure. So what is happening from a seizure to status epilepticus, previous slide. What are the, um, the consequences of prolonged seizures? So why is it needed to treat these children uh, with prolonged seizures? Can we identify? That's really important. Children and adolescents who are at risk for prolonged seizures. Um, how um, and who? How can we make a plan for these children? And, and who should get an individualized emergency seizure plan? Can I have the next slide now, please? So. Next slide. Yeah, I think you all know this. Um, it's quite important. In the beginning of a seizure, you will have, and you will see this in green, um, you will have a lot of GABA receptors on the surface of a neuron. But while the seizure is going on, these GABA receptors get internalized. And at the same time, and we, not, we do not know exactly when that happens, but at the same time, we see more NMDA receptors appearing on the surface. So there's a balance between decreasing GABA receptors on the surface in the beginning of a, uh, of a seizure, and then moving into more and more NMDA receptors if we go into status epilepticus. That's quite an important concept because that tells you that we actually in the beginning of a seizure really should focus on GABA. And you'll know, and I will not talk about the third speaker this afternoon, we'll talk about the drugs, but we have the benzodiazepines to, ta to target these GABA receptors. Next slide. We actually also know how these GABA receptors are internalized. It's quite a complex system, but we know this already for years. And, and I think some patients might have a problem or actually genetic mutation, one of these steps in this pathway to internalize the GABA receptors. No details about this, but this is the idea. GABA receptors are disappearing while a seizure is uh, going into a prolonged phase. Next slide. Now, if we talk about prolonged seizures, and we have all sorts of terminology for this, but let's assume a prolonged convulsive seizure, what are the risks? We all know about SUDEP, of course. We all know about acute morbidity and uh, mortality. 
There are also systemic effects. We, if, if you really develop a long-lasting uh, status epilepticus, there's a high risk of developing brain edema, generalized or focal. Um, there is some damage to brain tissue if you go into status epilepticus, and we also think, but that's not really very clear yet after all these years, that one status epilepticus, even one can have an influence on the full epileptogenesis in a child with uh, epilepsy. Next slide. Uh, this is a very simplistic view on this, but I think it's right. The only problem is that we all really don't have quantitative data. We all know that the longer a seizure is lasting, the more potential for neuronal injury, as you see. And, and the three entities that we are talking about are these prolonged seizures. So the beginning or already moving into status epilepticus. And we have another topic, acute repetitive seizures. And actually, it will turns out that turn out that this also is a very important entity, very difficult to treat, especially in the community by parents and caregivers, because it's so difficult to judge when uh, a next seizure will come in this cluster of repetitive seizures. So the longer a seizure is lasting, the more potential for injury. We just do not know exactly when that turning point is, when there will be neural injury. Next slide, please. Now that there is a problem with the brain if you go into status epilepticus, that we can see this in several uh, large series of uh, outcome in children with status epilepticus. So this is the result of status epilepticus and a cohort of 302 children, one of the largest series. And you see, of course, we are very happy. We are doing a little bit better than the adults. About 80% is still okay after the status epilepticus and after intensive care, but 80% means that 20% uh, is doing not okay, and about 12 to 13% really end up with extra neurological consequences after the status epilepticus. And even in that series, you can see with me that there is a little outcome in about 10%, which is actually a high number if you think about this. Next slide. Now, prolonged seizures. How should we define prolonged seizures? How long is a seizure lasting in a child with epilepsy? And I think we have to go back to the fantastic work of uh, Shlomo Shinar in 2001 already, more than 20 years ago, when he looked at um, large groups of children with new onset seizures. And, and, and they just would write down how long these new onset seizures would last. And you see the different patterns. You can look at all seizure types, tonic-clonic seizures, focal seizures, generalized seizures, idiopathic seizures, as it was called at that time, remote symptomatic or younger children, or older children. Now, if you look at these curves, they, they follow what you what is shown with the green lines. There are like two parts in that curve. There's one steep part down and then a slower part. That means that there are two populations. Next slide. And if you look at it uh, statistically, there are indeed two distributions, as we call it. There's the first large group of like three out of four children. And, and in that group, the seizures are lasting less than five minutes and on average like 3.5 minutes. But there is a group of one out of four children with new onset epilepsy that presents with a long lasting seizures, 31 minutes on average. And you can see with me like uh, about 12%, more than 30 minutes, 16% more than 20 minutes. So these are already dangerous long lasting seizures. But the point here I want to make is that there is a close correlation between the first seizure, the duration of the first seizure, and the duration of the, cons of, of the second seizure. And that means that if you have a long-lasting seizure, can I have the next slide? If you have a long-lasting seizure as your first seizure type, and this is in black, then the likelihood that the next seizure will be long-lasting is very high. So that means this helps us already, and that's a major point of, of my talk, this helps us already to identify children at risk for developing prolonged seizures. If you ever had a prolonged seizure, you have a high chance to develop another long-lasting seizure. So that's what we learned from this curve on the, on the left side. On the right side, statistically, it's very difficult to understand, but if you look at the probability of a seizure stopping by itself, after a couple of minutes, you see that this uh, likelihood is really decreasing, and there is a turning point around 10 minutes. And that's probably one of the uh, historical reasons why we always use these five and 10 minutes uh, thresholds. You can see that if a seizure lasts for more than 10 minutes, the likelihood that it will stop by itself is becoming lower and lower and lower, and even in that statistical model, non-existing. So 
for all these children with prolonged seizures, and, and we have already a first hint, who should that be? Those who already presented with prolonged seizures, we need an emergency seizure plan. We have to prevent or try to prevent the next prolonged seizures. Next slide. Now that there are children with several long lasting seizures is shown in, in one of the most recent large studies uh, published in 2022. They looked at, at uh, and this study will come back again during the next hour. They looked at, at the frequency, for instance, of status epilepticus. And you see that a lot of these children, if you look to the right, more than five times status epilepticus in their life, there is a large group of these children. Of course, they include children such as Dravet syndrome, lenox castor syndrome, but there are children who really experience uh, a lot of prolonged seizures. Next slide. Now, who, was, who are these children? Who are the children that develop prolonged seizures or let's say status epilepticus? It's difficult to find data on syndrome by syndrome. It's more like etiology driven, like here again in this last, large uh, latest study by Meyer et al. Um, you can see in the, in the childhood ages, um, the, the number one is prolonged febrile seizures. So that's the number one reason for status epilepticus in young children. Infection associated, and probably these include some of the children with Dravet syndrome, is, is number two. And then, then you can see metabolic derangements, incorrect medication, acute seizures. But for younger children, it's especially febrile seizures and infection-related seizures that have the highest risk to go into a prolonged phase and to go into uh, status epilepticus. Next slide. Even if you break this down, and this is a very old slide, um, if you break it down by age group, you can see between one and five years that remote symptomatic and prolonged febrile seizures are really the top two etiologies uh, for prolonged and acute uh, long-lasting seizures. Next slide. Now, before I develop this any further, the first question for you, and it's a bit confusing because there's no right or wrong answer. I just want to feel what you think. And it's, it, it's just a reason to show you, yeah, we have guidelines, we, but still you have to think case by case. So the question here for you is, um, you have a child, a two-year-old child with Dravet syndrome, and uh, the child is uh, non-surprisingly non um, developing another generalized tonic-clonic seizure and you're the parent of this child, when would you give rescue medication? Uh, immediately after the start of the seizure, after three minutes, after five minutes, or after 10 minutes? I think, um, please vote now, and I think you have like 20 seconds to give your right answer. Okay, do we see there's a, ah, fantastic. Um, that's what I was hoping for. Um, I will talk and all the other speakers will also talk about five minutes and 10 minutes, but this is a peculiar case in a Dravet child and you know that these children will develop status epilepticus. I would also tell the parents if, if really you can train the parents and instruct them very well, I would not wait for five minutes in a child with Dravet. I would not wait for three minutes. I would also go for immediate rescue medication. Probably I'm wrong. Probably you could wait for three minutes and still stop the seizure right there. So there's no right or wrong, but the earlier, the better. And that's what I want to develop right now. Next slide, please. So if you look at um, all these published protocols for status epilepticus, you, you see a couple of things that are becoming clearer and clearer. And it's more clear in childhood protocols, childhood epilepsy protocols than in adult protocol. The first thing is that if you say that in the first five minutes, you have to think about rescue medication, that means that you're actually asking to give the drugs outside the emergency room and in the community. So it's a pre-hospital treatment that we should talk about. Otherwise you're too late. Time is brain, I would say. And then the next thing that we are learning in all these protocols, and can you, uh, yeah, next slide and next slide, just to highlight a couple of points, yeah. The next thing that we are learning, you, you give in the community a first benzodiazepines, and I will not detail which one. This will be covered in one of the next talks. And then if it does not work, then you go to the next phase, again, benzodiazepine, but most likely intravenously. So the point I want to make here in my talk is we go out of the emergency room, we go into the community. A child is having a seizure at school and in home. Somebody has to give 
the rescue medication. Otherwise, all this theory of time as brain is not valid anymore. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the point is, and that's what we read in all these papers, if a seizure lasts very long, more than five minutes, and five minutes is already long, we have this high risk of status epilepticus. So that's a time window for an intervention, and we have to do this out of the hospital. So again, this helps us to identify children at risk. But then there comes a very difficult discussion. Um, you, you will read, and, and Rita will also talk about this. Yeah, we, we have clear guidance for generalized tonic-clonic seizures. It should be five minutes, and then you should do something. If you have a focal uh, convulsive seizure, then you can wait for 10 minutes. I, these are guidelines. Um, I, I don't know what to do with a focal seizure with impaired awareness, with some smacking, without any clonic movements. It's very difficult to instruct the parents and other uh, people to give medication at that time. So we, we, we give instructions, especially for convulsive seizures, also because it's quite clear that the child has a seizure. For many of these absence-like seizures, focal seizures with impaired awareness, it's much more difficult to give real guidance and to say after three minutes you have to do this or after five minutes you have to do this. We also believe, and that's the other point, that convulsive seizures are more, uh, uh, there's a higher likelihood that there will be more brain damage from convulsive seizures than from non-convulsive seizures. That's probably true for absences, but not true for focal, um, focal seizures. So there's a lot of um, yeah, issues to talk about uh, this timing of five and 10 minutes. I think we need clear guidance, but it's difficult to find the theoretical background for this. Next slide. So treatment delay is the key issue. Time is brain. And if I go back 20 years ago, and the studies of Palak, I mean, it's, it's surprising if you see these numbers. On average, at that time, it took like more than one hour before the child would get the drug, the first drug. It would take 30 minutes before the ambulance was there and then another 20 minutes before you're in the hospital and then another 30 minutes before you start the treatment protocol. It's not valid anymore. It's not happening anymore in most of our hospitals right now or in most of our centers. We really want to reduce that time. 85 minutes is way too long if, if you believe all the stuff that I talked about, about damaging the brain after five or 10 minutes. Next slide. And that's another Pellock study in 2004. You, you see exactly the, the very strange numbers. And honestly, I think this has changed in the pediatric epileptologist, but there's still a long way to go in adult epileptology. Uh, still, there's not this same sense of emergency. If, it, if an adult is having a seizure on the street or at home, they still wait for the emergency uh, or the ambulance to give something. I think we, we, can, we might change that. Next slide. Now, just to illustrate that point again, Richard Chen published a very nice paper, and this was a, a terrible protocol, but all the services in that area were instructed to give the first line rescue medication, benzodiazepines or paraldehyde at that time, at home in the streets before they would move the child into the hospital. So this was per protocol. It was a large study. Now, there were like in that study, 240 episodes of convulsive status epilepticus. 93 were not treated. So this was already a protocol violation. And I don't know why. But it tells you something how, how difficult it is to treat out of the hospital in the community. And then there were 147 episodes that were treated per protocol. Not per protocol in the right sense, because they were treated, yes. But they were always treated, not always, but they were most likely treated with a too low dose of the benzodiazepine. And that's why the second red star, only 33 of the 147 uh, seizures were terminated by the very first uh, treatment. And it's only because the dosage was too low of the benzodiazepine, not because it was the wrong one, but because the dose was too low. Next slide. If you go into more detail, oh, on average, on the left side, you see in the, the red star again, pre-hospital treatment within 15 minutes, 15 minutes, only in about one out of four children. Whether you look at episode or children, one out of four. Now, that was considered as fantastic within 15 minutes. But if you believe the five and 10 minute story, this is already too late. On the right side, you see um, 
what is the likelihood that the child will develop a very long lasting convulsive seizure? The two major points are no pre-hospital treatment versus pre-hospital treatment. So if a child did get benzodiazepines before it enters the hospital, chances were lower that the child would develop a long lasting status epilepticus. And then here comes this very difficult story of intermittent seizures. So the child has a seizure, recovers a little bit. Uh, everybody thinks that it's okay. Then he goes into another seizure. He's okay for 10 minutes. Then another seizure. These are very difficult situations. It's very difficult to guide or parents uh, or our caregivers to treat that sort of clusters. And we need medications and th this will come. We need medications to also treat uh, clusters. But if you had an intermittent uh, situation like this, the chances were also higher to get a long lasting um, status epilepticus. Next slide, please. Same story in this other published uh, long, large series. What were the reasons for a shorter time to cessation of status? Next slide, please. It's, as you can see with me, the red stars. Application of a benzodiazepine as an initial drug shorten latency from status epilepticus onset to initial treatment and a higher or a normal dose of your anti-epileptic drugs in the first place. So it's the same story. Early, right dose, that's the way to go if you want to prevent status epilepticus. Next slide. Now, study in 2021, they looked at the current practices um, and they looked at three different drugs, diazepine, midazolam, lorazepam, used uh, to treat in a, in a first line an ongoing long-lasting seizure. And in red or those with uh, too low dose did not meet the guidelines. So that means they did give lorazepam, but at too low dose, three out of four children. Now, if you look per kilogram, that's the right, um, right um, lower panel of this slide. Um, especially for lorazepam and aslam, you're doing not great. I mean, in that study, so too low dose, not guidelines following. For the diazepam, it was a bit better. So there was more adherence to the guidelines for diazepam than for the other two ones. But the, the message is clear. We, so if we believe that we give to give uh, benzodiazepines, we really have to give the right dose. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so to summarize again and again, if you look at all the delays and the problems causing increased morbidity in status epilepticus, and I will not read everything, but just the lower part, use of seizure action plans. So we need to develop these seizure action plans, the emergency plans. That's what we are talking about today. We need to prescribe and instruct parents to give the right rescue plan, and we need to train everybody. Uh, and to try to convince all the caregivers, also the school teachers, to, to be able and to, to be allowed to give these rescue medications early on during a seizure. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. So we come to like a sort of a personal um, view on all these things. What is for me uh, an ideal rescue medication? And we know it's benzodiazepines, but they should be effective. Uh, they should not be a medical set, should be easy to administer. Uh, I, I don't think you can ask from the parents to, to open a syringe and to, to, to withdraw some fluid from a bottle. No, it should be easy to administer. And the dosage should be really adequate. That's what I stressed and pre-calculated. There's no point that you have to calculate at the scene how much benzos you would have to give. Also, what I see in clinical practice, all these drugs, they have a, a preservation date. So especially with the, the last midazolam products, we have some problems with that. I don't believe in rectal um, administrations anymore for older children. So don't get me wrong, for babies, it's still okay, even sometimes for older in, in institutions. But if you have the choice of to go for buccal or uh, nasal, it's probably much better, or intramuscular, it's probably much better and more socially acceptable than rectal. And of course it should be safe, but that will be covered uh, in the next talk, I think. But on average, the risk of a prolonged seizure is way uh, higher than the risk of side effects of a single right dose of benzodiazepines. Next slide. 
So keep it simple. If you develop an emergency seizure plan, uh, if you identify a patient and you need to develop an emergency seizure plan, and there are lots of patients like this, I think it's better to not to use 10 drugs. Uh, try to familiarize yourself with one product. Train the parents, train the caregivers, um, even with, with some, yeah, just to show how you do it. If you say, I, you need to give this bucally, nobody understands what bucally is. You have to show it to the parents. Um, of course, you don't have to forget the normal protective action. So don't put anything in the mouth, uh, put the, the child on the, on the side and things like this. Um, and then advice per patient. That was my question. I don't want to give you guidelines on three or five minutes. So it's not fixed. It's per patient that you think about this. But on average, for many of the diseases that we are treating, it's like if it lasts longer for three to four or five minutes. And then it's a difficult, and we might discuss about this, if that rescue medication does not work. I think, first of all, you have to wait a couple of minutes before you see that it works. It's not like uh, in, immediately that it will work. But you have the feeling that the seizure is going on and it's even becoming stronger. So probably you're not successful. At that time, or even earlier, and that's a discussion point, you can call the emergency service. One line of thinking is, yeah, if it's that bad, if a child has a seizure of five minutes and you're, you have to give rescue medication, probably it's not unwise to call an emergency service immediately. The other way of thinking is, okay, I do what I have to do and the child is okay, but then who will take care of that child recovering from a long lasting seizure? So probably also there you have to call an emergency service. So I, I'm not out of, clear about this for every single case. Some of the parents know their children very well and they know I don't have to call the ambulance every time. So, but it's a case by case discussion again. But if it doesn't work your first line, then you have to discuss a second line. I personally think that the second dosage of benzodiazepine should be given by a medical professional. I think that the risk of side effects becomes higher if you leave it in the hands of non-trained uh, people. Uh, so a first um, rescue medication is okay for everybody, I would say. You have to train them, of course, and you have to give the right dose, not too high and not too low. But the second one should be more under medical supervision. And also you have to discuss who can give the rescue med medication. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. I will skip this one. Um, so last slide, uh, I think, yeah, and that's the most important one. Who needs a seizure plan like this? And I think we already um, touched upon this. Patients who already suffered from a prolonged seizure or status epilepticus, for sure. Uh, you have to talk about uh, acute rescue treatment. I would say also the, all the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, but these include the number, uh, the first line. I mean, they all have prolonged seizures, uh, most of them. And I'm talking about lenos castor ring crunty dravet syndrome. Epilepsies with seizure clusters, and I honestly think this is quite difficult. You really have to know the patient very well. You know they have to parents. You know have to you have to know the parents very well. You really have to have a nice plan and we are hoping for better drugs to avoid clusters. The other group that is sometimes mentioned in the literature, but that's also worth a discussion, um, adolescents, um, because we know that the compliance in adolescents is very low. Uh, don't fool yourself, it's really low. Uh, perhaps the caregivers around the adolescents, although they are starting to live on their own, but the caregivers around the adolescents might uh, should be aware of rescue medication in that particular case. I would not prescribe it for the typical absence epilepsies, but you have to make the right diagnosis uh, for the, the so-called Rolandic epilepsies uh, or for simple febrile seizures. So I think there is a group that we don't need to do this for, but the, a large group of, with epilepsy really have to, um, you have to think about these emergency seizure plans. Next slide. You will find in the literature many examples. I just took two ones, the one of the Epilepsy Foundation. It's quite complicated. So on the lower left, you see when the rescue medication may be needed. And there's a detailed story. When should it give it and how much should so this is what the patient should have it uh, on him. I mean, this is what the caregiver should know and what the patients and the school teachers should know about rescue medication in this particular patient. And the next slide. So my last slide is what we developed for Dravet syndrome. It's much more instructive in a way because we really choose for two drugs. I, know, I don't think anymore that it's really right, but we say give, if, in, if a child with Dravet has a 
long lasting it's midazolam or, or diazepam so no no major choices and then the next phase is also described for that particular child so this is um, i think my view on on this whole topic early adequate benzodiazepines for long seizures that's my point thank you very much Thank you, Lee Ben. I think but I've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to post them at the end because for the sake of time, this part I'm going to move straight on to the next speaker, if that's okay. So next speaker is Rita Kalbianum from the University of Eastern Finland and Kokyo University Hospitals, who's going to talk about emergency seizure plans in the adults. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, now comment on some points uh, related to adults. Um, I uh, work in Kopio University Hospital, which is also a member in the European uh, reference network EpiCare for complex and rare epilepsies. Next slide, please. So um, outcome of status epilepticus, of course, in adults and also especially in elderly patients is much worse, in fact, than in pediatric cases. So uh, for example, in refractory ep status epilepticus, 30% of the patients uh, will experience some morbidities and 30% uh, mortality. So also, especially in adults, we do have a medical emergency. We need to uh, recognize the situation early and we would uh, treat, we should treat the situation urgently. And, and all the facts and, and uh, 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 procedures that Lieben-Lager uh, suggested for many pediatric syndromes and especially for epileptic encephalopathies, of course, are uh, then uh, very important also in adulthood for those patients that continue with the syndromes in, uh, in later on life. But if we think about then what more widely also those patients that um, have well-controlled uh, epilepsy as adults. Epilepsy can lead to fear and anxiety, uh, which can influence the ability to engage normal daily activities and also affect quality of life. And I think uh, we, we should start from the fact that we need much more general information and education of first seizure aid. And this might help al already the situation overall. And this, this should be the uh, task of um, uh, together with ILAE and IPE chapters, for example, like what we have been doing in Finland. This is the uh, first aid uh, project uh, where we have uh, um, described uh, all the different seizure types or most of them. Uh, and, and really the, the main issue has been that we tell that anyone can help a person who has epileptic seizure and then uh, also described what to do when you meet a person with a seizure, for example, at the bus stop or, or in, a, in a workplace or wherever. And, and we have also uh, built up videos and, and that uh, really show how the first aid uh, is, is to be done. And this, this would be very important first step overall throughout the world. And then we move to individual seizure action plans and seizure emergency plans which of course then empower the patients and caregivers and, and reduce the anxiety associated with these emergencies, but also of course, with the better treatment, decreased risk of status epilepticus, also hospitalizations and, and mortality. Next uh, slide. Uh, the delay of treatment as already described by Lieven is probably also uh, uh, worse in, in adults. Um, uh, we just recently in our area in Finland uh, looked prospectively uh, cases uh, with over five minute seizures. Uh, this was a population based study and uh, found out that the median uh, delay for getting the first medication was uh, either pre-hospital or in, in hospital was 40 minutes and the median delay for arriving to the hospital emergency was one hour 40 minutes 
uh, our area is quite rural. Uh, so that, of course, influences the situation, but still these are exactly the same numbers as, as were in the, in the pediatric study uh, that uh, Leven already showed. So the situation is not much better, even though we have worked really hard in our area to make it better. So there's so much more to be done. Also, uh, coming back to the times, uh, time uh, definitions, uh, definition of ILA task force uh, tells us that uh, five minute duration of tonic-clonic convulsions should be uh, the time when we start the rescue treatment for convulsive status and perhaps uh, 10 minutes for focal seizure activity. Now there's a lot of discussion that we should perhaps move towards uh, more acute treatment, so-called rapid uh, emergency seizure termination. So um, when uh, we know already that the person has a tendency to have prolonged seizures, we should start the treatment earlier. And this is in fact what we do, for example, in the video EG monitoring unit, where the patient perhaps have had uh, the um, medication tapered, so that they don't have the usual medication anymore. And if we see the seizure, we look at only the, the beginning of the seizure for diagnostic purposes, and then we rapidly uh, terminate the seizure with the medication, usually benzodiazepines. So in future, perhaps also in pre-hospital care, we, we are going to move to this kind of acute seizure termination principle. And also in the clusters of seizures, we would move to acute seizure prevention to the, in those patients where we know that they are going to have clusters. And of course, this needs to be discussed with the patient and the family uh, beforehand when, when these kind of situations are recognized. But this is going to be the discussion uh, in the community and perhaps we need to move uh, more actively to this uh, 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 direction, and then, then we are going to perhaps prevent more status epilepticus in the future. Next slide. This is uh, my poll question. Uh, which adult patients do you think that would need emergency seizure medication? All of them, only drug-resistant patients, uh, drug resistant patients and selective other cases individually, or drug resistant patients with adequate caregiver support and selective other cases individually. Again, no right answer, but just to find out what your ideas are. Please answer. Well, this is interesting. Um, I know that there are colleagues who um, uh, always, even when they see the patient for the first time in the emergency unit with their first seizure, uh, prescribe uh, uh, seizure, emergency seizure medication or rescue medication. Personally, I don't understand this because um, uh, sometimes I, for example, see uh, young patients uh, having buccal um, midazolam in the rucksack without any kind of guidance uh, or caregiver instructions how to use it. And this is, of course, not the way to do it. So perhaps we should think about to whom to prescribe it. And, and there needs to be plans. So next slide. This is my thinking uh, when we have an adolescent or adult seizure-free patient with medication or newly diagnosed patient where we don't know what is going to happen. I would say that we only prescribe emergency seizure medication for very special occasions for these patients. But what we should do is uh, we should make seizure action plan for everybody. and. Um, this um, traditionally has been something that we do on paper. Nowadays, it could be also digital, and of course, it could be or should be 
put to the um, uh, electronic medical records. But what uh, more and more is used and perhaps should be used are also the smartphones. Uh, in every smartphone, there, there is, um, uh, in case of emergency, ICE apps uh, that allow the first responders to access critical medical information on the phone without knowing the password. And I, I think this, for example, for those people who do have these phones, is, is a very good way to put this information into. So there's already the personal information existing. And then together with the healthcare provider or the neurologist, uh, you are together in collaboration with the patient, define what is the type and etiology of epilepsy, describe the seizures, uh, put the, the emergency contact information of the uh, family members, and then also the neurologist contact information and, and the medication that the patient have, and then define together uh, how to help the person during the seizure, even if it's not prolonged, uh, because this is for all the seizures. And then if there's need for emergency seizure medication, for example, when the person is traveling or hiking in Lapland, in our case, or, or whatever special occasions, when there is a person who could give the drug, then emergency seizure medication could be used. And then info when the person seizures, person seizures require, require calling uh, emergency medical services when it's so prolonged that that's needed. And if there's something else, very important. And then this is the last thing is very important also, when to contact neurologist after the seizure. Because sometimes these are, uh, especially the use of emergency seizure medication leads to a situation where only the emergency medication is used, but the uh, long-term medication is not corrected or increased or checked. And that's not, of course, good. Next one. Then we have the scenario of uh, drug-resistant epilepsy in adults. And, and in this case, we need, of course, the seizure action plan, but then we need also the seizure emergency plan. And this is more what Levin was already talking about. And then we need always the use of the instructions and education for the use of the emergency seizure medication also. And, and then in future, we are going to talk about more the acute seizure termination very rapidly and also the acute seizure prevention for cluster patients. And again, the same uh, instructions also individually when to call the emergency medical services and which emergency to consult and transfer. It might not be the nearest one. It might be then the specific place where the, the patient is taken care of and who and, and uh, which place already knows the patient and, and which is the best place to take care of this particular patient. And the next one. Then uh, this is, for example, an example of a progressive myoclonus epilepsy patient, part of the CISA emergency plan. Uh, these patients are uh, might have generalized tonic-clonic seizures, uh, which usually are rare if medication is taken care and, and is stable. But you in the then in the seizure emergency plan uh, state when there's a place for acute seizure termination medication after, like for example, two minutes. Then when you repeat the acute seizure termination uh, medication, which I think in adults we very often, especially in chronic epilepsy, we use one repeated dose of, uh, of seizure emergency medication. And then when to call the emergency medical services uh, if, the, if the seizure doesn't stop. But then for example, in this particular case, there are also myoclonic jerks than, that can exacerbate. And, and this is a very typical situation where, where at home, urgently, if the situation is taken care in a very good way, uh, avoiding the 
uh, lights and loud noises. And, and if the patient is taken care in a quiet room and with a small dose of immediate uh, benzodiazepine treatment, the situation might go over. Whereas if it's not taken care in a proper way, uh, then it might lead to an emergency visit where again, uh, the situation might escalate unnecessarily if it's not taken care properly. Again, in the... Um, uh, in the medical records, of course, this needs to be repeated for those doctors who are not familiar with the particular disease. Next slide. And this is my uh, last slide. Um, I, again, I think that Caesar action plans are underused and they their use should be expanded also in adults and especially they should be also implemented you might uh, make together with the patient seizure action plan and emergency plan with the family, but they, they are, for many reasons, they are not very well implemented in, in adult patients' life. And this is something that we should work better. These should be customized, they should be individualized, and they should be user-friendly, very simple, and they should be also reviewed and updated annually, at least, or if there are changes in the situation. And we should educate also uh, patients and caregivers about uh, these details. But this is something really that uh, would perhaps really uh, help also to prevent unnecessarily status epilepticus and morbidity and mortality in these patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rita. And again, several questions arise that I'm going to save up to the end and proceed to our third speaker, Adam Staschek, who's from the University, of, University Hospital of Frankfurt in Germany. And he's going to tell us about what we may use, particularly the benzodiazepines. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Helen, for this kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to give this talk. So next slide, please. So I'm talking today about benzodiazepine and how they should be or how they can be administered at what expect um, from that. Next slide, please. Um, I'm starting with this rather historical slide. Here you see this comparison of out-of-hospital status epilepticus treatment for convalescent status, comparing lorazepam, diazepam, and placebo. And you can see that some seizures will stop, obviously, at 30 or 40 minutes, but this can be surely alleviated if you start early with diazepam and lorazepam. And keep in mind at that time, uh, it's on the left side, the duration of status epilepticus until treatment was around 30 minutes. So it took quite long to treat. And then you can see that despite use of diazepam or lorazepam, uh, still around 40% of patients stayed in status, probably because the treatment started late. And as Sleeton said, we are improving on that. Next slide, please. Um, so I would like to know from you, which are your favorite benzodiazepines for prolonged seizures or status epilepticus? So you have the choice. We can start the poll. And you have the choice between lorazepam, midazolam, clonazepam, diazepam, or another benzodiazepine or drug. And feel free to put in everything. I'm not asking about the route of administration. It's just what's your favorite drug in the setting where you are working. I think this is very important. So we see the answers. And I think that's what we expect. Most of them are using midazolam, followed by diazepam and lorazepam. And that's probably due to their local availability. Next slide, please. So um, I think we saw the data uh, from Aldrich about convulsive status. And if we talk about acute seizure plans, obviously, in most of the cases, there will be no way of intravenous um, drug delivery. So we have to look for alternatives to intravenous benzodiazepines. And this will be the next part of my talk to get through all these possibilities with you and to discuss that. So obviously, we have direct application. We have also some sublingual um, tablets, which are quite problematic. I will come to that in a second. 
Then we have intranasal uh, possibility. So we have Baltoco and um, Nizilam, which are very new devices, um, which are at the moment, to my knowledge, available in, in the US. Then we have obviously Bucolam, which is widely used. And then we have older things like epistatus or self-made intranasal um, midazolam, which we are using in our hospital and which might be an option if you have not a better access to that. Next slide, please. So I think standard of treatment was or is in certain uh, cir um, circumstances diazepam recules. It is well proven that it has had a good efficacy, but it's obviously difficult to apply. And it's getting more and more difficult with an increasing age. Also, it's associated with stigma. And then another point, what is in Germany very popular, are lorazepam expedited buccal tablets, which should dissolve, but be aware any use of tablets in of an oral intake usually will have an onset of action after 25 minutes. So it takes quite a long time until this drug work. Next slide, please. And obviously, um, the use of rectal diazepam gel was also tested versus placebo 1998, published in New England of, um, Journal of Medicine. You can see um, this was superb working compared to placebo. So there's no question that we have to use it. And this data is important because the next studies, and I think this is important from an ethical point, were tested, for example, against rectal diazepam. And um, if they um, showed an equal effect, you can assume they are as good as this gold standard from the 90s. Next slide, please. So this is um, a comparison. Now we are coming to intranasal formulation between intranasal midazolam here in blue and intravenous um, midazolam. This was already published more than 20 years ago. And you can see that the time with intranasal midazolam to cessation of seizures is much faster than if you use intravenous diazepam. When we talk later about the Rampart study, in all the studies, you can show that obviously intravenous drugs are using um, are working very well, but there's always this delay of five, six, seven, or eight minutes until you get an IV access in children or adults. Next slide, please. And this is something what we do in our hospital already for the last 15 years. It's a self-preparation intranasal midazolam. Um, and it's um, manufactured by our pharmacy. And we started to use it in prolonged seizures, seizure clusters after generalized tonic chronic seizures and also in status epilepticus. And we apply two puffs, so one puff per nose, and this equals um, five milligrams of midazolam. And on the kaplan meyer curves on the right, you can see that um, in those treated with midazolam, here the blue ones, the time until next seizure is much um, longer or it's, it's longer than those who were not treated with midazolam in um, acute setting of uh, VDG monitoring. So at the moment in our department, this is the standard of care for using in VDG monitoring just to get less generalized tonic clonic seizures. That's something also what we could show. And then to um, have a better, let's put like the distance between um, duration between two seizures and to have less clusters and less status epilepticus, although less status epilepticus I cannot prove statistically. Next slide, please. And this is just a very short EEG case report. So it's an, um, it's an old lady of around 70 years old with a bifrontal status epilepticus. You can see this, this delta with, with sharp waves in the, on the frontal um, montage. And then next slide, please. That's before we give midazolam. Next slide. And already after three minutes of intranasal midazolam, you can see this flowing and disappearance of this delta and the sharp wave on the EG. And then next slide, please. After five minutes, we give another 2.5 milligrams. Um, I think this was not necessary, but I was impatient. That's the solution. And then you see a very nice flattening of the EG. There are no signs of status on the EG. Next slide, please. And this was the last slide. So patient was awake, so there was no um, respiratory problems and status was gone. Next slide. And that's something what we thought we have to look into. So at our center, we, we really wanted to know if intranasal midazolam is going to terminate status epilepticus. And we have a lot of patients who come to our department, mostly also with a non-convulsive status, 
and they are first hooked up to the EEG. And sometimes they have no IV access, so this is not working. And we decided, okay, in these cases, we will always start with intranasal midazolam and then, you know, prepare for IV treatment. And we have done that in 42 patients. And um, in some of them, seizure was seizure onset was recorded on EEG. This was in the video G monitoring unit. And in 27 patients, they were coming from us. So we don't know when a status started, but for, it persisted for quite a long time. Next slide, please. And then here you can see on the left, the Kaplan-Meier curve in responders. So you can see in most of the patients, status cease after five to seven minutes. On the upper part, you see the non-responders. We had also some patients who were already treated after four minutes with additional IV benzodiazepines or levetiracetam. So we didn't count them towards a response to intranasal midazolam. But with that, we could show that we have an, an, a nice um, stopping of status epileptics activity within EEG if we use intranasal midazolam. And then obviously on the right, we, we did some other analysis to look on, into the beta, beta band power increase, which shows you when uh, benzodiazepines enter the brain because then you have this increase of beta power band. And this happens usually after four minutes. So that's the time when your intranasal drugs start to act. Next slide, please. So also, this is this was shown that it's working in a healthy province. This was a study by Hartmeier. And our conclusion was that we usually give it to all patients who are in status or in a seizure while we try to establish an intravenous access. And on the right side, during corona pandemics, we had a problem to get midazolam salts because it was sold out worldwide. And then we started to use also midazolam from an ampule put up in a syringe. And then you see on the bottom, an MAD, a mucosal atomization device, which you put on the syringe, and then this one milliliter containing five milliliters of uh, midazolam could be uh, atomized in, in, in the nostril. So you get this um, clearly nicely to the patient. But this was used just for a part when we didn't have midazolam salt to prepare our pharmacy-based solutions. Next slide, please. And obviously, there are two new intranasal agents for seizure emergencies. And um, they are available in, in the US. And the one is Nizilam, so midazolam nasal spray. The other one is the diazepam nasal spray, Valtoco. And both are licensed with different ages. So Valtoco from six years of age and older and midazolam, Nizilam from 12 years age of and older. They are licensed for the treatment of um, as rescue medication of, um, of seizure clusters, which is unusual for the patient. I think they will also, also work in status epilepticus. And we know that um, these drugs will um, work quite fast. Next slide, please. Um, then we come to buclomidazolam. Um, this study here on the left shows very nicely that um, the time to seizure cessation is almost equal in those tra treated with rectal diazepam and buclomidazolam. And I agree with Lieben and also with probably Helen and, and Rita that Bucolam is the way to go instead of rectal diazepam if that's available because it's easy to apply and is associated with less stigma. Next slide, please. And then um, what I already mentioned, the Silverglide study, um, so Rampart looking into comparison of intramuscular midazolam versus IV lorazepam. Next slide, please. And the important point was that it takes just long to get an IV access. And um, when you are in an out-of-hospital setting or even in the hospital without an IV access, then consider another alternative route. IM midazolam is a possibility if you have an available uh, product. You can also put it up in the syringe, but an auto-injectable device, which was used in the study, would be the best option because this time um, is precious. And in the end, it's... Um, you are in favor of, um, of ending the convulsions earlier than in the idea because you have spared this minute at the beginning. Next slide, please. So now the next question, what is your um, preferred route of administration for prolonged seizures and impending status epilepticus? So this is usually what you uh, use for your um, acute seizure termination plans. Now you have the option between rectal, oral tablets or drops, buccal, intranasal, or I put it together, intramuscular or other 
options. It will depend on the available in your country, but just to get an impression of what is used in the community all over the world. So we have those. That's what we have expected. Rectal is not very uh, popular, and it's good that you don't use oral tablets or drops because they are that would like that useless. Buccal intranasal, I think that's the way to go. And obviously, intramuscular, maybe other options are also used in the community. Next slide, please. So um, very importantly, and I think this is what Lieben said, um, my recommendation would be to have one intravenous benzodiazepine, which you like to use, and one alternative route with the same or with another benzodiazepine. So don't get confused in your hospital between different options. Just opt for one. In our hospital, it's intravenous lorazepam, then also at two to four milligrams um, per patient in adults. And then the non-intravenous non um, route is midazolam intranasal spray, where we always give five milligrams to each adult patient or also to adolescents. This, may be diff this will differ in small children, but we will go only to 2.5. Clonazepam is also an option very popular in um, francophonic uh, countries. And then also you have diazepam. Be aware that diazepam goes very fast into the brain, but then it also has a very fast um, time going out of the brain because, because of redistribution to the fat tissues. Next slide. And um, just one point on that, even if... Um, rescue medication might be exp expensive, so maybe 20 or 30 uh, euros per one, per one treatment. Um, there are studies, um, this is the one from Lee, and here you can see uh, the Markov model, how it was um, investigated. If you use um, uh, rescue medication, you can prevent ambulance calls, you can prevent um, uh, transportation to hospital, and very importantly, a treatment at a, an ICU. And by that, you will save money. And this was uh, shown by the Lee work. It was done, I think, in five or six European countries that it's cost effective in, in every one of these countries. Next, please. In our hospital, um, we decided to go for um, emergency treatment. So we have a small bag where we have an intranasal midazolam. We have also intravenous ampules. And also then later on levetiracetam and valproate and lacosamide. But that's something what we carry on with us so that we can immediately apply that to the patients. Have a thought about it if that might be also something for you. But I think very importantly for the first step, um, choose your um, benzodiazepine and try to figure out at which dose you can use it so that you don't have to calculate in the emergency. Next slide. This, this will be the last slide. So this is a um, systematic review of foods of delivery of different benzodiazepine. And you can see there on, on the left, you have left upper corner intravenous application. If that is done, um, time to onset of action is one to two minutes. So it's the fastest way, but it takes you time to get there. And then on the others, you see buccal EM and intranasal application. And this takes around three to four minutes for all the drugs which were tested. Next slide, please. And this is now a combination of the time to application, which is the longest for intravenous because you need this time. And then if you put that together, probably the alternative routes are a little bit faster. So it's really worth using them uh, before you establish an IV access. And the last slide now. So this is the conclusions. Um, and I think um, it's all said by now. So intravenous, um, that's the way to go if you have an access. But before um, you do that and you have still to establish an intravenous access, go for a nasal, go for intramuscular, or go for a buccal application. I think that's the way to go. And you should establish one in your hospital with set dosage regimens. And you can think about rectal diazepams, but I think this is um, really restricted to very small children. And then oral tablets and drops, they have no place in the treatment of status epilepticus. The only point might be if you have clusters, which are they put like that every 30 minutes, then you could do it to prevent the next seizure, which will occur in 30 minutes. But otherwise, let's try to stick to the other drugs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Adam, for that fabulous overview.
If I can ask Rita and Levan also to turn on um, video cameras. And if you have any um, questions, to please put them in the question and answers at the bottom of the page. We've already got quite a few, but I'm going to start off with a couple of questions in the first instance um, to ask presenters. Levan, firstly, in giving um, rescue medication or prescribing rescue medication, how do you decide on which patients that children really should have that? Do you consider it for all or do you have, are you selective in who you prescribe it? Um, there's no right or wrong answer. I think I, I'm a bit selective in the way that I try to get the parents very well and that they are familiar in a way with epilepsy and with seizures and they have uh, already witnessed a seizure in their child. And so if this sort of uh, family with the child um, is ready to go, I think I would prescribe to many patients a rescue medication or an individual uh, care plan or an emergency plan, not only the Dravez and the Lenox Castos, but uh, actually also including some of the more benign epilepsies, but only if they already suffered from a really severe prolonged seizure. I think that's my entry point in the whole uh, story. So if I see an absence epilepsy for the first time or the second time, and I, I saw this is one of the questions also in the, the q and I, I mean, there is a theoretical risk that as an absence epilepsy uh, also have a convulsive uh, seizure, especially in adolescents. I know this, GME and things like this, but, but for a typical childhood absence epilepsy, I would not discuss rescue medication. Um, I might be wrong. It's a bit the same story as with SUDEP. Do you explain every, in every child the risk for SUDEP? Or, I mean, it's not the same, but you have to be selective in, in who you're talking to and, and who you're instructing for, for these treatments. Thank you. And just an extension on that, really. And, you know, we're talking the other extreme of, for example, Drave patients who may need to use it quite frequent, frequently. Is there any concern about tolerance to the benzodiazepines? That's a very good question. Um, personally, I don't see a lot of tolerance. Um, many of our patients with Drave are on, on clobazam, as you all know. And it, it is not because they are clobazam, they are that they are reacting less to, for instance, uh, lorazepam intravenously or bucolam or whatever. So, but I, have, I don't have any study material. I cannot prove the point, but I don't have the feeling that there is tolerance. I think if you use another one than the clobazam, it's okay. I mean, there are still a bit differences between all these benzodiazepines. So that's probably why we don't see the tolerance, but I have no, no hard data to prove this. Okay, so Adam, do you have a comment on that? I agree with Levin that we, we rarely see um, a development of tolerance. What is mostly reported by the by the parents of those adolescents or uh, adults in my case is that they um, react better to one or the other uh, benzodiazepine. So if you see that they fail book alarm, they probably have to switch to something else. This is one point about that. And then where you can see tolerance is when we have to admit uh, those to the intensive care unit, and then they have uh, ongoing benzodiazepine treatment with clobazam, for example, then you might not be able to put them into anesthesia with midazolam only. Then you have yeah. to use for sure propofol or even go to teopental. But that's that's a very specific part, I think, beyond this second seizure plan. But in hospitals, that can be seen, but I think not in the in, in out-of-hospital setting. Thank you. And Adam, there's a couple of questions I'm going to join together. There's one about the, the intranasal midazolam solution that you prepare. It says, when does it expire? And the other question I think is linked to that is, um, she says, it is, I think you did talk about this, but expanding, because I don't think that the person who asked the question picked up on it, about if you don't have the nasal, can you use the IV preparation? And I have to say that we, you, we started by using that buckley. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think uh, yes to everything. So when we use the um, the self-made preparation, this is usually um, viable for two to three months. It depends on our pharmacy, but usually they write down three months or something like that. Um, the problem is that we have quite a lot of midazolam in the bottle. Um, and um, I think you could put very easily more elephants to anesthesia with that because it says around 250 milligrams in the bottle. So you have to be very careful and we use it only in hospital 
by a supervised person so that you don't get too many intranasal um, hubs. But what you can do is with the intravenous ampules, this is usually five, milli five milligrams per one milliliter that can be easily drawn into a syringe. And then you can use this mucosal atomization device. And this is very popular, for example, uh, among German uh, paramedics. So they use this very frequently because then you have no problems with viability of the, of the drugs. So I think this is the way to go if you don't want your pharmacy to, you know, to prepare something for you. And midazolam ampules are available everywhere. Just be, um, put attention to that, that it's five milligrams per one milliliter and not five milligrams per five milliliters, because then the amount is too big for your nose. Thank you. So, can I, can I, so, so, I mean, this is, this is really okay if you do this in hospital settings, I think. What Adam was just talking about, I cannot expect my parents to open a bottle of midalazum and then really look at the uh, I mean, it takes time and they will make mistakes. So that's why I like Bucolam. I, I'm not, I, I, for me, the company is not important, of course, but Bucolam, you don't make any mistakes. You say five milligrams, 2.5, 7.5, once and one single shot of this one single syringe, and it's okay. All the rest is much too difficult for most of our patients. So the moment you enter a hospital with nurses, everything is okay. But outside the hospital in the community, I have more problems with all these sophisticated preparations. Um, that, that's my view, eh, Adam? Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. So the intranasal self-made stuff, that's what we use in the hospital. And I think we are eagerly waiting for intranasal preparations to be available in Europe. Once we have them, we will use them in the population. And then there will be a good choice between buccal and uh, nasal preparations. I fully yeah. agree. Can I continue from that also? Yeah. Um, I also uh, think that it's very important that uh, the amples are for pre-hospital home use are already well prepared beforehand. But uh, still, um, sometimes, as I said, uh, we use uh, smaller doses from those pre-prepared amples, and that's totally okay. So you don't have to use all of the ample at the same time. So that's one point. Sometimes less is enough for some situations and but not more <laughs> that's very important but then i also emphasize that it's very important that we discuss with the patients and caregivers because sometimes there there are strange misunderstandings that people are using these uh, pre-hospital medications in totally wrong way they they think for example that buccal medication is taken rectally or rectal rectal is taking buccally if you don't rehearse and re-educate and, and, and check that they have understood it in the right way. So we think it's self-evident, but they, they can think it differently. And for example, coming back to those seizure-free patients or well-controlled adult patients which, who have unnecessarily been given these medications. I once had a patient who was a CEO of a company and I asked him, why do you have this rectal diazepam? Well, I take it before every important meeting to myself before going to that meeting. So like I would have now taken my to myself before this this uh, webinar. So uh, it's very important to have this individual seizure management plan, emergency plan, and really check whether people have really understood what we are talking about. Thank you. Absolutely, Rita. So, so following on from that, there's a question here about cluster seizures and acute repetitive seizures, and when we should give the rescue medication in relation to that. But they're actually asking, and again, this may seem straightforward to us, but is it only when the patient has the seizure or can we give it in between seizures? Rita. Well, I would say that these medications should be only used um, to uh, stop the seizure, so um, acute seizure termination, or to prevent clustering, uh, but not in between. So, um, th uh, and uh, therefore, it's also very important to then contact the pediatric neurologist or neurologist if there are problems and, and and in this plan again it should be stated when to contact 
your treating physician, because then, of course, the long-term treatment should be also evaluated if there are a lot of uh, clusters or prolonged seizures. And that's that's especially important if, if the epilepsy is just diagnosed. And therefore, I, I, I try to avoid prescribing these emergency medications to uh, um, recently diagnosed patients, because they might understand that you treat epilepsy with emergency medication and not with long-term medication. And, and that's, of course, important also to separate. Thank you. But in, in um, preventing clusters, if people have acute repetitive seizures and they know that after one or after two, they're going to always go on to a third, giving them something after that second can prevent the cluster. Exactly. That's very important, of course. Understand. Yeah. yeah. There, there's and a new... There, there's, yeah, there, there's a new uh, concept growing, and, and some of us are involved in all these discussions. We will... In the, in the very near future, talk about treatments that stop a seizure and then treatments that actually are preventing the next seizure. So the ones that you could use in clusters. But even then, you have to know your patients even better because like you say, Helen, some of the patients say, I know if I have two seizures today, I will have three seizures tomorrow. And actually, the very first study that Adam was showing on the diazepam was a, a sort of a prevention study. The outcome was how many seizures do you have after 24 hours? It's not stopping the seizures, but preventing the next one. And so th this is a very subtle academic discussion, I would say, semantic discussion, but probably we'll end up with, with drugs with a longer accent, uh, I mean, period, like diazepam. And then you have drugs that really are shorter working, like midazolam, to stop a seizure and not as good for preventing the next seizure in a cluster. These, these studies and discussions are ongoing, but I think we will see in the near future the distinction between these two concepts. Uh, stopping a seizure and preventing another seizure in the cluster. But that's the most difficult situation, cluster epilepsy, um, how to deal with that. Going on from that, Levin, there's been a couple of questions about the role of emergency rescue in spasms. And it's not, do you want to just comment on that? There's been one question about, do, should we manage sp clusters of spasms like this? And another question about management over the age of two years of clusters of spasms. Yeah, I think we, if, if you're really talking about spasms, this is the wrong discussion then because we don't use rescue medication for spasms. There are guidelines to treat spasms and it would be wrong now to advise that if you have a, a young child uh, actually presenting with clusters of spasms to use benzos. I think there are many more and better treatment uh, guidelines for spasms than and just using benzodiazepine. So, I really would not um, in, be in favor of that sort of uh, treatment uh, possibility. No, I don't. I don't think so. I think I'm, to I'm total agreement. And you know, and I have seen patients who have been refractory to initial treatment for spasms, and then because their clusters go on longer than ten minutes, they've been treated with benzos, and it doesn't work. It doesn't make any difference. So, if they're true clusters of spasms, I would not advocate use benzodiazepines at all for acute treatment. Okay, Adam, there's a couple of questions about do non-convulsive seizures require rescue medication? Yes, if you see them on EEG, then yes. <laughs> I think the problem is that um, obviously non-convulsive seizures, if we don't talk about absences now, um, about proper non-convulsive status epilepticus, you, first, you have first to recognize that. And that's obviously not easily done in uh, out of hospital settings. Sometimes you can see subtle motor symptoms like twitching of the mouth, then you can go for uh, emergency treatment. No question about that. But if you are unsure, then obviously you will need an EG and then you are already in the hospital. But otherwise, yes, if you are quite sure, I'm not a big um, advocate of using something just you know for trialing out. Uh, I don't like that. So you have to be sure that there's a status and this for that you need an EG. And maybe that's, uh, but that's also another point about out of hospital, you know, four or eight channel EGs where you can look outside. That That's maybe the way when we have that available everywhere. And I think that's a point for Rita because the Finnish people are working on that. Um, then you can have already a very um, profound and um, straightforward treatment out of hospital of non-convulsive status. 
I would like to comment on that. Not what you said, uh, Adam, um, that's still work ongoing, but again, I would like to emphasize knowing the patient. So there are sometimes um, non-convulsive seizures that are quite long, like for example, in ring 20 uh, syndrome um, that don't need to be treated at all. Uh, they, they just, if you know the patient, you can wait. I remember one patient that um, lived alone and wanted to go to a club or meeting of um, to get peer support and and had taxi tickets that he, she could drive with taxi to the meeting. And every time the taxi driver got her to the hospital because of the seizure, <laughs> although when she got to the hospital, the seizure was over and she could have gone to the meeting of the epilepsy, uh, epilepsy association so that was a very sad situation so so again individual plans for treating the seizures thank you i think it's a very right point rita i think where we have where we get problems that some of the patients where we discuss that at the early stage of diagnosis we don't know yet as doctors how this epilepsy will evolve it's very easy if I see in transition clinic patients and they tell me stories about the last eight years and then I know how the clusters look like. That's very easy. But if the epilepsy just started, you don't know how it will evolve. That's 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 very challenging. Thank you. There's a question here that if the patient develops a seizure in the emergency room, so I presume they're not seizing when they arrive, would we wait three to five minutes or just give the benzodiazepine? I think the answer is quite easy. You get your stuff and this takes two to three minutes and yep. then you start treating. So um, I think we have to keep in mind, we have very academic um, um, you know, reasoning about that. So what we have seen in our study, although we are an epilepsy center and we are all very keen in treating them, we looked in our status epileptic study, how long it does it us take to give the drugs from begin in the EEG when you can say there's a status and I have to admit it was between eight and 15 minutes. So there was no question if we have to start immediately. We did not start immediately and this took quite a long time. So I think, and if everyone who's asking that question thinks about the time points, then uh, until we get there, already three or five minutes easily passed away. Everyone in agreement, does anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, you, you, you still have to rely on, on the basic knowledge that the seizure, most of the seizure will stop after one or two minutes. I mean, we are, we are now focusing, of course, on these prolonged seizures, but the large majority of all the seizures, and actually one to two minutes is already a long time, but most of them, 95% will stop within one, two or three minutes. So I agree with Adam, if you prepare your syringe with lorazepam, uh, it will take two or three minutes. and. By that time, the seizure will be gone. And then the other message is, but it's open for discussion. Imagine that you're there and the seizure is over and the patient is still, of course, asleep or post-ictal. Do you need to give benzos? I, I say no, but some people do. And eh? they say, I want to <laughs> I want to prevent another one. I, I'm not sure that it's over and I'm waiting for the EG. And I, I, for security, I will just give an, a shot of, of uh, lorazepam. I think that's wrong. If, if the convulsive state is over and, and clinically you don't see any signs of a seizure ongoing seizure i would not give benzos the seizure is over um, but that's also happening in ambulances they take somebody from the street everything is over he's confused and they still give uh, intravenous medication i think that's wrong in my opinion i would agree i think parents also get the wrong message if people start to treat in that state and you realize that they may be treating every time, you know, even when they stop convulsing because they think they're still in the seizure. Yeah. Again, it's education. So the other question, which is the reverse of that probably, is, is there a maximum number of doses of benzos in 24 hours? Uh, Adam? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, I would go back to that what Levin said. So first, obviously the first dose and it should be an appropriate dose should be given by lay person out of hospital. And then I think uh, the second dose is um, is reserved for the paramedics or doctors. There will be uh, there will be uh, exemptions to that. There are drive families. They have something like intensive care unit at their home. Yeah, 
and they know when can I give a second dose after 10 minutes or something like that. This is well well done, but um, I think otherwise I would stay with one dose. And then the question is, when can you give the second dosing? And usually, um, if we look at our PRN prescriptions in the hospital, we say something like up to three times per 24 hours, but not but more than three hours apart or something like that. And if you want to go, then you have to, to stick to something like that. Um, and very importantly, what would be my recommendation, don't mix up different benzodiazepines. So what usually happens that someone starts with lorazepam tablets, and then it doesn't work, obviously, because it cannot work within 20 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, they get um, they get anxious, and then they give midazolam, and then they give something else, and then everything accumulates at minute 20. So this is something, don't mix up drugs, just use one, and one you know. So and, and another extension of that, maybe to all three speakers, is you know we you know the studies we currently show that we underdose more than overdose. You know there seems to be a reluctance to give the, the appropriate dose. So how do we get around that? How do we change that? Yeah, well, like like the pre-filled syringes with bucolam is one way to go, but even then there's a large difference between two point five and five if you calculate milligrams per kilogram. But uh, you, yeah, we need to find... Um, I, the only thing I'm saying, you cannot rely on the patients to calculate the dosage. We, we need to have something very easy and pre-produced with, with different dosages and with different colors or whatever, so that you don't make any mistakes and you give the right dose. I wouldn't know any, anything other than that. Um, as, uh, especially in children. I mean, in adults, probably it's more a standard dose. But it's also professionals, healthcare providers, paramedics, uh, also uh, doctors in the emergency unit that underdose. So it's yeah. not. <laughs> the, the, so this is the problem. Everybody in the in the care pathway does it. So what I'm I'm thinking um, for many reasons, not only this dosing issue, but other reasons also that we should. Um, we are planning now to do um, care pathway for acute treatment also not, uh, in, a, in a way that we, we have been doing for the long-term treatment uh, and where we also discuss a little bit because, the, uh, for example, Finland is a very large country. So it's, it's a little bit different in Helsinki in a large city than in Lapland. So, um, so thinking about also the rural areas and, and how do you should then treat, you, you need to give the second dose at home and so on. So while waiting the paramedics to arrive and so on. So uh, we need to think individually these situations. Thank you. Thank you. And there's also the education that seizures are dangerous, that everyone is so worried about the effect of a respiratory depression with a benzo. Actually, cumulative doses of small doses are more risky than actually one large dose. Um, and the seizure itself, as quite eloquently illustrated by all of you, can be really problematic. So, you know, it can cause, you know, if you have it ongoing, getting some intensive care. So people get the wrong message that actually the benzo respiratory rest actually is less problematic than actually the seizure itself. Not that we would want that, and it, it doesn't occur very frequently unless you have cumulative doses of, for example, diazepam. Okay, on that note, I think we're coming to the end of our 30 minute uh, discussion time. Fantastic discussion. Thank you for all the questions that have been posed. If I can have the slides again, great. Um, just to emphasize that you will be um, asked to complete a short survey that will pop up when you leave the e-forum and you'll receive a certificate of, ten of attendance after submitting the survey. Tomorrow, you will, all of the participants will receive an email with the details on how to access a self-paced virtual case to consolidate your learnings. Please keep an eye on our social media pages and our website to learn more about other educational events that, and activities the IA offer. The next e-forum is on older people in epilepsy which will be held on the 20th of November. And of course, this e-forum has been recorded so that it will be available on demand from tomorrow. So on that note, I thank our speakers enormously for the contribution. I thank all of you for staying the 
a duration and your participation with all your questions. They've been absolutely really um, contributed to the discussion. Um, and if you could just spend a bit of time completing this survey, then we'll know how we need to change things for the future. Thank you very much for your participation.